And when the Ammonites saw the Arabians running, they ran from Abishai and retreated in their city too. After the battle was over, Joab returned to Jerusalem. The Arabians now realized that they were no match for Israel. So when they regrouped, they were joined by additional Arabian troops summoned by Hadadezer, excuse me, from others from the other side of the Euphrates River. These troops arrived in Helm under the command of Shobak, the commander of Hadadezer's forces. When David heard what was happening, he mobilized all Israel, crossed the Jordan, and led the army to Helm. The Arabians positioned themselves in battle formation and fought against David. But the Arabians fled from the Israelites. This time, David's forces killed 7,000 charioteers and 40,000 foot soldiers, including Shabbat, the commander of the army. When all the king's allies of Hadadizar saw that they had been defeated by Israel, they surrendered to Israel and became their subjects. After that, the Arameans were afraid to help the Ammonites. Amen, somebody. Amen. I know it's a lot to, to take in, but let's just pray. Heavenly Father God, we come to you right now and we just say thank you. We say thank you for being a great God. We say thank you for being the ruler of the universe. We say thank you for the, being the master of everything on this earth. Heavenly Father God, I thank you for being the master of myself. I pray, God, that you will take my heart, you will take my mind, you will take my spirit, and you will speak through me, God. Heavenly Father God, I pray that as your people are listening to your word, that they will hear directly from you and not me, God. Heavenly Father God, I consecrate my lips right now. I pray, God, that you will take complete control. I pray everything that will be spoken will be taken into each and everyone's life, and they'll be able to take it throughout the week. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. Amen. First off, I just want to give glory to God for allowing me to be here today. I thank God for my parents. Mommy, I know you're alive right now. What's up? I thank you both. I thank my sister, Evangelist, for just inspiring me. I thank ECC for accepting me. I thank for my youth. service so we're filled we're great everything is going well and then it's like okay let's go about our business we choose our destination which is what Walmart so we're, we're, we're packing up we're going to the car the next question is okay who's driving who's driving right who's driving the title of today's sermon is who's driving who's driving so let's look it back to the practical when we get our license, excuse me, when we get our permits, right? We want to drive. Mano just got his, um, his license before. It was like, oh, can I take you somewhere? Can I take you to the store? Can I take you to work? Can I do this for you? Can I do this for you? Mano, he got his license. You know, can you take me to work? Oh, man, I just got up. I'm tired. I'm, I'm just, man, like, uh, you got to go now. Like, um, like oh, really? I got I to gotta do all of that? So basically, it's like, once we get our permit, once we start to, once we get something new, it's fun. It's cool. It's like, oh, I think I can do this. But then when we become a little bit more invested, and once we really understand what it takes to drive, it becomes too much and we eventually start to retreat from it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So what is drive? Drive is basically you get into a car, you go from one place to another place. You know where you want to go, vroom, 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 you're there. But now let's go a little deeper. Drive. What is drive? Drive is also motivation. What motivates you to do certain things? For example, there's drive that is used to take you to work every day, that job you hate. What's pushing you to go there? There's drive that brought you here to be clapping and screaming and everything in church today while it's hot. What drove you to do that? The drive that allows you to go take care of your kids, drive that allows you to work the second job. What is driving you? Who's driving? So I did a little 
little research, I wanted to check Google just to see, okay, what does the world think about drive and everything like that. So I was able to find seven things. I'm just going to run through it really quickly. Um, seven things that drive people to get things done. Some people just enjoy the idea of completing a task. They enjoy the process. For example, I'm a makeup artist. I just enjoy doing makeup. That's all. I enjoy the process. Some people enjoy meeting deadlines. They're satisfied knowing that they got something done early. Some people are driven by anxiety. They just want to avoid shame, fear. Some people are driven by positive recognition from others. They want a well done, a pat on the back. Some people are driven by perfectionists. Perfectionism, excuse me. A perfectionism, a perfectionist pursuit of excellence in all things. Some people are driven by purpose. A strong person's emotional commitment to their personal goals. And seven, some people are driven by their willingness to just learn from their mistakes. They want to say, okay, I was able to do this. What did I learn from what I did? But in Second Samuel, I want to point out three things that drove people in this chapter to do some of the things that, that they did. And the three things that I noticed that was their drive was people, was God, and some were driven by fear. So we're not only going to discuss drive, but I wanted to also dis just to discuss the result of what happened from how they were driven. Excuse me. So, and you know me, I like to go verse by verse. We're going to go to chapter 10, verse 1. So can I get verse 1 on the screen? And again, I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation. Some time after this, King Nahash of the Ammonites died, and his son Hanan became king. Verse 2. David said, I'm going to show loyalty to Hannah just as his father Nahash was always loyal to me. So David sent ambassadors to express sympathy to Hannah about his father's death. So this is going to be a little bit of interactive sermon teaching, excuse me. So I want you to just call out your answer, what you think the answer is when I ask a particular question. So in this first two verses, we see that... King Nahash, he died, right? And Nahash was a good, I guess he was a good king to David. So David said, you know what? I'm gonna show loyalty to his son just because of him. So his son Nahash, he didn't do anything to deserve kindness from David, but David just being, I guess, the good person that he is, he said, you know what? I'm going to be kind to you. I'm gonna show kindness to you, Hannah. So his, his drive was being, excuse me, his drive was from people, practical. I know we can think about it and say, oh yes, God was his drive, he was driven by God to do this, but let's just think practical right now. His drive was based off of his, um, the goodness that he received from King Nahash. So he was good to his son, Hannah. So verse two, excuse me, verse three. The Ammonite commander said to Hannah their masters, do you really think that these men are coming here to honor your father? No. David has sent them to spy out your city so that they can come in and conquer it. I'm going to go to verse 4. So Hannah seized David's ambassadors and shaved off half of each man's beard, cut off their robes at the buttocks, and sent them back to David in shame. I'm going to give a quick example. I need a big guy here. I need a big guy. Now, come, please. Can we clap for you as he comes from the back? <laughs> All right, you can have, well, actually just stay there really quickly. So just looking at this picture, if you were to, if you wanted advice from, from someone, who would you go to? You would go to the king, right? But let's think about it this way. Hannah, he had his servants tell him something. His servants, mighty. They said, David is not here to give counsel. David is here to spy on you. He's here to do this, do that, do this, do that. And what did and, and what did Hannah do? Instead of Hannah to realize how big he was, instead of Hannah to realize how great he was, instead of Hannah to realize how powerful he was, he took the advice from someone that was beneath him. 
You can have your seat. You can have your seat. Who, you like Who are you receiving counsel from? Who are you receiving counsel from? We're going to keep going. You have to be careful, my youth. You have to be careful about who you receive counsel from. I know we like to say, oh, I'm my own person. I do this, I do that. But we have to understand that the people around us, they do inspire us. They do kind of show us what we should do, what we shouldn't do, whatever. But let's just move forward. We're going to go down. Excuse me. Amen, somebody. Amen. Amen. And, and also, in, chapter, in verse 3 and 4, we can see that people still have the wheel. We can see that people are still driving another person to do something. And in that case, it was his commanders, the people that were beneath him that were driving him to do something. And it's okay. It's okay for people to drive you. It's okay for people to be able to give ideas to you. For example, um, it's okay to be driven by people. For example, David was good to Hannah because of how good Nahash was good to him. So that's okay. But then in this case, we see that people that were beneath him gave him, people that were beneath the king gave advice. So it led him to now his downfall. So we can see again that it's good and it's bad. Another example, myself and Lalu. We were going to our friend's birthday party, and um, like I said, I don't like to drive. Lalu's always the one to drive, right? So, but this time, we were in a rush, so I said, okay, I'm gonna drive, I'm gonna drive, I'm gonna drive. And Lalu was giving me directions. We were going someplace that we always go to, so, and it's someplace that, um, that we all, our parents even take this same route. But then Lalu, I guess she discovered a new way of going there, but because I was so embedded in the way that I wanted to go there, we ended up getting there later than we should have. So you see, if I were to take Lalu's advice, I'm sorry, can we please take the children to the back? They're kind of disturbing me. Amen. Yes. If we were to take the route that Lalu introduced me to, I would have gotten there a lot quicker than me taking the route that I was used to. So you see that it's good and bad to be driven by people. So now the bad. Let's talk about passenger seat drivers, right? Who knows what a passenger seat driver is? Sister, what? Elder, huh? A passenger seat driver. But they were like, you know, we're still going to tell him whatever we 
fail, and then it's gonna be all wrong. Imagine if we were the one giving God's instructions. Just, just I want you to really think about that. Imagine if we were the one giving God instructions. It will be calamity. It will be horrible. Hallelujah. Verse 4, so Hannah seized David's ambassadors and shaved off half of each man's beard, cut off their robes at the buttocks, and sent them back to David. So David heard what had happened. He sent messages to tell them, stay at Jericho until your beards grow out, and then come back, for they felt deep shame. David was chilling at this point. Let's start from the beginning. David wants to show kindness to Nahash's son, Hannah. They took it as, oh, he came to spy on us. So they cut their, um, the bears of David, men, they embarrassed them. Yeah. They went on their way. David saw what happened, and he said, you know what, cool. Stay there, come back, and your bears go back. David could have easily retaliated. He could have done so many things. He could have sent his men out there. Think about us now. If someone were to come and slap you right now, what would you do? You will slap them back. Let's be honest with ourselves. But he said, you know what? Stay there. Wait until your bears go back. Driving David there. God, wisdom. Wisdom comes from God. God was the one that was driving David there. David knew what was happening. David knew. If we go back to 1 Samuel 16, verse 1, that was when David was first appointed king. When he was told, You will be king of a great nation, Israel. I know where I will take you. This, that, this, that, this, that. Can we actually can we go to 1 Samuel 16, verses 1? I want someone to read it for me. 1 When you find it, you can read it. Can you read it a little louder? And the Lord said unto Samuel, I am without much to serve, saying, I have rejected him from training over Israel. Then I'm going to jump to verse 10. In the same way, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel asked, Are all of these your sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse replied, David. But he's out in the fields watching the sheep and the goats. Send for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome, and handsome with beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, This is the one. Anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil, and the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Then Samuel returned to Ramah. Then we're going to go to 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 8 and 11. So we see there that David knew he was anointed to be king. He knew where he was headed, even though he was still just a, a shepherd. So 2 Samuel 7, Verses 8 and 11. I'm going to read it. Now go and say to my servant David, This is what the Lord of heaven's armies has declared. I took you from tending sheep in the pasture and selected you to be the leader of my people. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have destroyed all your enemies before your eyes. Now I will make your name as famous as anyone who has ever lived on the earth. And I will provide a homeland for my people Israel, planting them in a secure place where, where they will never be disturbed. Evil nations won't oppress them as they've done in the past. So as you can see here, God is saying, I will. I will make you this. I will create this from you. I will do this. I will do this. I will make you great. I will be the one that says you are to marry. I will be the one that will make you a millionaire. I will tell you where to go. Not once did David say you will be the one to do this. So if we go to the next chapter, if we go to chapter 8, we see that God was now fulfilling everything that he promised him. He told him that he would defeat nations. He was defeating the Philistines. He was defeating the Arabians. He was defeating all of these people. He was doing everything that God said he would do. So David was already, he was backed up. He was like, okay, God spoke this. So you know what? Whenever something else comes my way, I know that from my past experience, I can depend on that because he did it before. So then also, as, um, in chapter 8, again, 
He defeated nations after nations. And then also in chapter 9, that's when he shows kindness to one of Saul's grandsons, Jonathan's son. Why would he do that? Saul was a great enemy of his. Why would he now be in the king's palace and say, you know what, my enemy, bring his son. I'm going to give him a seat at my table. It's because God was the one that was driving him. It's because God already told him where he was going. It's because David was secure in where he was headed. He was the one he knew who was driving. So now, again, chapter 10, he wants to show kindness to Hannah. But Hannah now looks at it as some way else because he, Hannah was being driven by fear. So he now did something that he shouldn't have done. But, but, God, but David, still being driven by God, he saw what was coming from Hannah. And he said, you know what? Because God has already told me where I'm going, I'm not even going to do anything. And I'm just going gonna, gonna, I'm to take it and go. So we're going to move down to verse 5 and 6. Can someone read it for me? 2 Samuel 10, 5 and 6. Excuse me, excuse me. Um, you can read verse 6. And when the children of Ammon saw that they stand before them, the children of Ammon sent and added the Syrians of the Israel, and the Syrians of Sulba, 20,000 footmen, and of King Maka, 8,000 men, and of Israel, 12,000 men. Okay, we can stop from there. So as you can see, David did nothing because God was driving him. But the Ammonites chose to go straight into defense mode. Why? Because what was driving them? Fear was driving them. And we already read through the whole chapter. We saw that David defeated them, everything like that. That's all good. But if we go back to verse 3, I want us to see what happens when fear is what's driving you. We already know. If God is driving you, we know, okay, you'll be in victory. Everything will be good. But let's be real. When something first comes our way, what's our first, what's our first response? What happens? We become fearful. We become exact, um, anxious. So I'm going to read verse 3 again. The Ammonite commander said to Hannah their master, do you really think these are the men that are coming here to honor your father? First thing that happens when fear is driving you, you begin to receive incorrect counsel. As we saw before, mighty and Emmanuel, you saw the difference in, in the physical. You just saw how ridiculous it looked. But that's exactly what happens when fear is, is, is the one that's driving you. Hannah was a whole king, a whole king. He didn't recognize his power. So it's like he was able to, because it, the thing about it is that we have people around us all the time that can give their input, say whatever they want to say. But if we're being driven by God, it's, we know how to separate the good advice from the bad advice. But when you're being driven by fear, that's when you now listen to the bad counsel and you also receive it. You actually take it in and it causes you something to do. It causes you to do something as crazy as start. Amen. So I believe Hannah came from a good home. I, I, I don't know. I don't see that in the Bible. But it's just so funny to me how they were able to give him advice. And then he took it so quickly. He didn't question them. He didn't do anything like that. But it's like King Nahash, he was good to David. It was apparent that he was good to David. So I'm pretty sure Nahash's father, he, when he was younger, I'm pretty sure he counseled him. I'm pretty sure he said to him, son, you're going to be king one day. I'm going to die one day. I thought about Lion King. Um, how many of us know the movie Lion King? When Mufasa took young Simba and he showed him the, the pride land. And he was showing him around. He was taking him everywhere. And he was saying, son, this is going to be yours one day. I believe this is what Nahash did with Hannah. So he received all of that. But then the second his dad died, he's now taken incorrect counsel from the wrong people. So it's like everything his father taught him went right away. And that brings me to my second point. What happens when fear is the one that's driving you? Insecurities begin to arise. Hannah did not recognize that he was a whole king, that he had the final say. And it's like, it, it, it's, 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 it's just, you have to know who you are. You have to know who you are. If you know who you're driving, if you know who's behind the wheel, if you know who's really in control, you will be able to take any situation that comes your way and say, you know what? I know who's driving. I know who's the one that's in control. I know who I serve. So, I want us to go to verse 6. When the people of Ammon realized how seriously 
they had angered David, they sent and hired 20,000 Iranian soldiers and the, from the land of Beho, Beth Rehob and Zoba, 1,000 from the king of Mecca, and 12,000 from the land of Tob. So it's like, you can see insecurities just coming all up and through that hurt. Not only did they use their own soldiers, but they went and called other people to come and help them. How crazy does that sound? Let's, let's really look at it. I want to show you kindness. I want to be good to you, but you see it as a threat. So instead of you to think that you can just fight by yourself, you now have to come and bring your sister. You got to bring your cousin. You got to bring your friends. You got to bring all these other people into your drama. Does that sound a little familiar, though? For example, I don't know why singleness keeps coming to me, but it's like a person that's single. God said you should not be in a relationship. But it's like, you know what? God, I know you said I shouldn't be in a relationship, but I'm 30, I want to be with somebody, this, that, and the third. Not knowing that you have insecurities that you have not dealt with. So now you're in a relationship, and not only are you miserable, but you're also making the next person that you're with miserable as well. You see how all of this just brings everybody into your fear? And then also, let's think about um, someone that wants to work. They, they, they know that God is a Jehovah Jireh. They know that God is the one that provides. They, in church every Sunday, oh, Jehovah Jireh, my provider, his grace was, is sufficient for me. Singing that, declaring that. And then you're still working 70 hours a week. You're still taking away time from your family. Not only are you tired physically, but also the people that you're working for, they're not getting your best version because you're, you're ragged, you're running yourself ragged. And then who else is being affected by this? Your family is being affected by this you're being driven by fear and once you're being driven by fear it's now bringing up insecurities within you and those old insecurities are now affecting those people around you so I want us to go to the last verse really quickly it says after that after the, the um, after they were defeated after David defeated them they said the Arabians were even afraid to help the Ammonites again so it's like not only were they defeated, but they also lost their friends. They also left, they, they lost their husband. They lost their allies. They lost the people that were supposed to support them. So that takes me to my last, my last note, to when you're being driven by fear. You make a mess out of what is supposed to bless you. You make a mess out of what is supposed to bless you. I feel like that just speaks on its own. If we if we go through the chapter, it's a really long chapter, I don't want us to run through it, but we see that, like I said, they begin to call 10,000 of soldiers from this army, they call 400 from this one, they call this one from this one, they call this one from this one. So many people died. So many people died, all because of what? Because the king, someone that did not recognize his power, he was being driven by fear. And then also, we see that what God, what happens when you're being driven by God, when God takes the will. We see that David was chilling throughout the entire chapter. David was like, okay, this is what's happening. I'm not gonna bite, I'm not gonna do anything. I'll just let my men go back, stay there, they can come back home. But then the Ammonites, they became fearful and they're like, you know what? We're going to send our troops to you. And then David, now being driven by God, he was able to look at it and say, you know what, I see this challenge now. I'm not gonna chill anymore. I see that these people are not coming to attack me. It's time to now get my armies. So now he did that, right? Because who was driving him? God. God. So this is not really a feel good sermon. I just wanted everyone to just see like what happens when you try to control? What happens when you try to press your invisible brake? What happens when you try to honk the horn? of the will that God has taken control over. Like I said, when we started this, I told my sister to sing a song, but God said to me, who's driving? Who's driving? So I want us to go through this week. Whenever we're going through something, as soon as we leave this place, something's gonna happen. Someone can now come and curse us out. Our boss at our job can get on our nerves. Our family members can probably do something to hurt us. We might want something to go this way, or our entrepreneur is here. We might want our business to go this way, but you have to remember, who's driving? God. Who's driving? God. Who's driving? God. Who is driving? God. It's not us, but it's him. I remember when Lala first gave me the word for this youth month. She said it's going to be fearless. I have 
have a friend here, Toby, right now. He can attest to it. Like, I was just thinking. I'm like, oh, my God. Like, what am I going to say? What am I, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? Fearless. I even tried to, to like, Google things, try to Google servants or fearless and this and that. I try to be inquisitive and, oh, F is for faith and E is for this and A and da da da, da and all of that. But God was like, no. Who's driving? Yeah. Who's really in control? So I want us to enter the rest of this youth month. I know our youth, we have a way ahead of us, but I don't want you to feel like it's you that's doing whatever that you're called to do, but it's God. I want you to remember that he is the one indeed that is driving. So can we all just rise to our feet? Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, God, we just come to you right now. We just say thank you. Thank, thank you for your word, God. We say thank you for being the one that is in control. Heavenly Father, God, we pray, God, that any spirit of passenger seat driver that we have that we have done before in the past, we ask that you will have mercy on us in the mighty name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, God, we commit our hearts and our souls and our minds to be able to trust you only. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you because we know that you indeed have the will. We thank you because we know that everything that we will go through, we know that you are the one that is driving us. We know where we are going. And Heavenly Father, God, we praise you because like we have sang and praise and worship this morning, we are going higher and we are going higher and we are going higher from glory to glory. And it's because of you and it's because of your grace. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
cleanse us, wash us clean, so that we are worthy. He died already so that we become worthy, but we may fall into sin and we may do things that make us unworthy. So let's pray that the blood of Jesus will cleanse us once again, that we will eat this bread and we will drink this cup unto life and not unto death. Let us examine ourselves, examine yourself, examine your mind, your body, and spirit, that as you take this cup, you will not take it unto them condemnation, but you will take it unto freedom. You will take it unto life and life in abundance in the name of Jesus. Father, we come before you this afternoon. We thank you for the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. We thank you for your body that you broke. We thank you for your blood that you shed. We ask, oh God, that as we take this body and your blood that we receive life in abundance in the name of Jesus. We receive life into every dead area in our lives today Amen. in the name of Jesus. We ask, oh God, that you will wash us, oh God, wherever we may fall short, oh God. Let your grace be sufficient in the name of Jesus. We say, Flowing. 